Welcome back to our continuing story of New France and Samuel de Champlain. In our last few episodes, we've gotten to know this character of Champlain. We've seen him as a young man. We've seen him as a spy, as a soldier, as a sailor. And by the time he's in his early 30s, he's fabulously wealthy. Doesn't have to lift a finger for the rest of his life, and yet he does. A friend of the king, and attaching himself to the wealthy Demont, he embarks on the expeditions to Acadia. The first settlement he's involved in, St. Croix, is actually inside of the borders of the modern United States, up in the very northern portion of Maine. A year after that, of course, is Port Royal. And then he finds his way to the St. Lawrence, and he founds the settlement of Quebec, which today, of course, would be Quebec City, and the name being lent to the entire Canadian province that you know well. From there, we saw his struggle to keep Quebec going and the trading flowing. We saw a failed coup that almost took Champlain's life. We've seen him fight in battles against the Iroquois, three, uh, which he was roped into by his Algonquian and Huron allies. And now we're coming up on the year 1620. Just to remind you, that's the year the Pilgrims landed at Plymouth. And so the English aren't as far away as Jamestown any longer. They've now moved up the coast. And in fact, they're inside of the territory that France would have called Acadia. So the stakes are being raised. And leading up to this mystical year of 1620, everything in France falls apart for Champlain. As always, wherever he isn't, things are going into ruin. And so he has to scramble back and forth across the Atlantic just to keep everything going. Why he does it, I don't know. The owner of this monopoly that Champlain is operating under has been imprisoned. And everything has gone to shambles. The investors in his company uh, blame Champlain for the high expenses of keeping the operation going. They strip him of all of his titles. Despite his royal titles and privileges and responsibilities in the New World, as far as the company is concerned, Champlain is little more than an explorer, while the king considers him Lieutenant Viceroy. When Condé is finally released from prison, he sells off all his privileges to his nephew, Henri, Duc de Montmorency. That is the best I could do with the French. Please forgive me. Champlain, persuasive as ever, is able to secure the same position he had before, more or less, uh, under the old owner with the new owner. Again, rebuilding everything almost from the ground up to return it to its former place. And again, he publishes another book on the area of New France. This would be his third book, I believe. I've lost count. But he's well published. And it is at this point that he decides that his wife should join him at Quebec. His wife of now 10 years or so, who is only about 22 years old. So you figure out the math on that one. Meanwhile, Champlain is circling 50 years of age. Just to review this uh, lovely marriage, his wife Helene never wanted to marry Champlain. Uh, and all the records show that, in fact, the earlier you go, the more she refused to participate in this at all. I believe somewhere around 1612, 1613, Champlain insisted that she move in with him in France, and she outright refused. In fact, she ran away from home, and it was only under threat of being completely disinherited from her wealthy parents that she resurfaced again and agreed to live with Champlain. A rocky start to a marriage, but then again, she was about 14 years old. And here she is at the ripe old age of 22, and she will be crossing the Atlantic to reach the very furthest outpost of French civilization, having lived for some time at the epicenter, Paris itself. I'm struggling to find a comparison for a, a modern person to understand the, the vast difference that Helene would have experienced, because we have the benefit of books and TV and movies and YouTube and just every source of possible stimulus in the world to show us everywhere else in the world, and then a bunch of imaginary fantasy places that we uh, indulge in when we go to sci-fi, so I can see Luke Skywalker prancing around an alien planet with a laser sword. Helene can't see any of that. Her world was consumed with France itself, and Paris specifically, and the high culture that was afforded to her status in her class. Perhaps she would be shocked by the conditions of a peasant just in the countryside. Now we're removing her not only from France proper, from Europe, we're removing her from that hemisphere of the Earth, and bringing her over to the Americas, to what you could imagine to be a Wild West frontier town. That might be the best way to put it. And that would even be generous. Because at this point, Quebec has basically no cleared fields. Uh, its inhabitants are 
described by several writers as prisoners. Not that they're criminals, it's just that they didn't seem to want to be there very much, and there was basically nowhere else to go for them. And so Helene not only would be moving from the pinnacle to the periphery, but then she would be exposed to this entirely different culture, the native cultures, specifically the Algonquian people of the St. Lawrence. Now, it might have been lost on Champlain, who had spent 20 years roaming around the transatlantic world, how odd this would be for Helene. And when they arrive in Quebec, it really dawns on Champlain how run down the place looks. It looks primitive to begin with. You know, most of the structure is made out of planks of wood. But it had been a couple years since he'd really invested time and money and manpower in his own presence, because he's been in France for a good chunk of the time, into keeping up the place. So everything just looked worn down to him. He was embarrassed. For years, his young bride had been hearing about this wonderful, mystical forest land that Champlain had some command over. And now that she was seeing it, Champlain was more motivated than ever to make New France into more than a series of trading posts. The poor residents of Quebec, again, couldn't trade with the natives. They weren't allowed to. And any products they created or obtained somehow had to be sold to the company. Everyone was essentially an employee. Quebec, with no farm fields to speak of, except for small gardens, maybe a couple acres, was not self-sufficient. It needed to import food constantly whenever they could, either dependent on imports from ships or by trading with the natives. On his way in with his wife, he found the St. Lawrence full of illegal traders, completely ignoring the uh, monopolies that were set up to protect the fur trade in Mount Morrency's favor. The great David Hackett Fisher writes that English and Dutch ships had been prowling the coast, some of them heavily armed, with crews that outnumbered the entire French population of Quebec. Some part of me believes that Champlain felt like a fool, because Helene, as we'll learn, was not, was not simple-minded. She was a very smart, educated woman, and she could see everything that was going on around her. And rather than Champlain being a great viceroy, in 1620, he might have been more of a paper tiger. But Champlain, getting up in years, was nonetheless an active, restless man. And he immediately began building a fort, Fort St. Louis, to protect all of the citizens of Quebec. Everyone could fit in there if need be. He also let Helene bring over a couple of French servants to keep her company and to help her out and to give her a little more of the lifestyle of a lady, even if she lived out in the Wild West. He goes about rebuilding a nice house for Helene clearing the St. Lawrence of private traders who don't belong there to begin with. He has to restart his relationships with the Innu natives in the area because they got quite used to all these different traders that they could play off one another. And suddenly they had to deal with the French monopoly once again. He dealt with that, which was no easy task because it was reported that the Innu were considering wiping out all of Quebec and Tadoussac. Once the center of the Innu monopoly, it was now a trading post operated by Champlain's men who had their own monosopy over the supply. Champlain de-escalated the entire situation immediately, and he invited the natives to live among the French and take up farming, which these Algonquian people to the far north had difficulty doing because of the short growing season and the thin soil up quite near the Canadian Shield. And if you move into the central and northern portions of the Innu territory, I'm pretty sure that's way up on the Canadian Shield itself. This was Champlain speaking the natives' languages. Native American tribes along the east coast of what is now the United States and what we call the First Nations people up in Canada, at least on this eastern portion of the North American continent, they had traditions of blending people together by having settlements near each other, overlapping settlements, and then eventually groups intermarrying. So one group from, from far over this direction and one from far over that direction, I'm pointing in different directions, I know, it's silly for me to say that in a podcast, would eventually find themselves blending and coming together. There'd be a cultural fusion. The natives understood this. And so when the French invited the Innu to live near them, this was only reaffirming their trade ties and their military obligations to one another. He knew exactly how to talk to them. Furthermore, at this time, Champlain learns to start supporting pro-French chiefs among the Innu and other native tribes. Are you going to be friendly to the French? Are you going to support French aims? Well, I'm going to do whatever I can to make sure you have as much power as you possibly can among your people. And Aline herself, to her credit, 
embraced her new situation. Instead of retreating into her bedroom with her little French maids to live her little French life, she embraced Quebec, and the natives were dazzled by her beauty and her charm and her class. All the records record this anyway. But this isn't very hard to believe, because Quebec at this time consisted of about 60 people. That was the entire settlement. And this wasn't a random selection of French folks. These were down-on-their-luck, hard-scrabble people who found uh, no other opportunity than a lottery ticket to the new world, and hopefully they'll make something of themselves. You're talking about mostly men like Champlain in his 50s, battle-worn, Pont Grave, who's probably coming up on 60, even more worn down in appearance. There was no sunscreen back then. There was very little health care. They didn't take vitamins. Uh, this would have been a population of mostly men who looked absolutely terrible. I don't know, picture like pirates from Pirates of the Caribbean. Like teeth missing, bad skin, everything else. Everything but the eyeliner, which I don't know where that came from. Ugly, ugly French people. But then there's Helene, a young woman who, unlike her husband, wouldn't look like a piece of driftwood. Helene would grow very close to the Recollet missionaries in Quebec. So whereas she, at one time, would have been considered a Huguenot, she became a, uh, a greater and greater adherent to Catholicism. And she wanted to convert the natives. And she got to know the Algonquian languages, and she would take care of sick Algonquian children. It seems as though Champlain knew that bringing Helene would be a good move for the business. So it's around this time that scholars believe the relationship between Champlain and Helene began to warm a little bit. Rather than her trying to constantly run away from him, she certainly accepted his presence. And as far as the records show, Helene increasingly became involved in Champlain's businesses, his estates, and managed some aspects of it, especially when the two of them were not on the same continent together. But for the modern reader, we tend to focus on these characters that seem downtrodden or underrepresented or somehow being uh, repressed. And this, this life was not the ideal for Helene. This was not her optimal experience. And so even I, every time I read about her, there's a, a tinge of sadness for those little things that she probably wanted, at least at some points, and would never get, you know, like falling in love, uh, having a courtship, having children, being in uh, something actually resembling a husband-wife relationship based on love and attraction to each other. Again, as I brought up in the last episode, there's no evidence that this marriage was ever consummated or normal, really, in any way. But perhaps that was normal for the time. So, let's move on. Back in France towards the fall of 1620, the Company of Canada that Mount Morrency managed and his uncle before that, had fallen apart, and the king had rescinded the monopoly. Again, everything is in the dumpster uh, once Champlain is somewhere else. So th there's nothing set up. Despite Champlain, again, propping up everything in the St. Lawrence, everything in France is in a gutter, dead in a ditch. The Company of Canada is allowed to trade right through 1621 as compensation, and then the monopoly is sold to the Decon family by the King of France. Now, this family is Huguenot. They are Protestant. This can become problematic at this point in time. Champlain, much like his wife, has become increasingly more and more devout in his Catholicism. And he felt personally that New France should be a Catholic colony, as did many of the investors and uh, most of the leadership in France at the time. So this monopoly was a little difficult to manage. Also, it appears the king himself had to issue decrees to the port towns to tell the people that this monopoly, this new monopoly, was in place and will be enforced. Because as soon as there's a crack in the weakness of who holds the licenses towards this lucrative fur trade, all the private traders start showing up. And it happens again and again and again. And this time, the king himself has to be like, you gotta stay out of here. I have issued a license to the Decon family, and they're going to be the guys trading in the St. Lawrence. In their agreement, they agreed to do a couple of different things. First of all, they were going to pay Mount Morrency for having taken his monopoly. Champlain was going to be retained, so good for him. Champlain was going to be given 10 workmen to head on over with him. 
They were to support the Catholic missions already over there, the Recollets at this time. We don't have the Jesuits yet. And they were supposed to settle six families of three or more people every year. The Company of Canada had a similar uh, requirement that they settle families, and they failed to do so, and that was one of the primary reasons their monopoly was rescinded. Moving into 1621, back in Quebec, Champlain is dealing with the types of people who uh, are in such dire straits that they're sent to Quebec. There have been a couple families there for a few years who hadn't done anything, cleared any fields, uh, opened up any new opportunities, learned any native languages. And so in 1621, Champlain actually starts sending families back to France for being useless. He sends two families in particular for these uh, specific reasons. And in his own words, they were useless creatures who cost more than they were worth. Obviously, there had been some strife in the small settlement. Perhaps it got big enough that uh, a little more order needed to be established. Because in this very same year, Champlain develops a formal set of laws to govern Quebec. He was no longer simple dictator. And he was a smart man to establish order right here, right now in 1621. Because there's, there's starting to be rumblings among the natives. Things were going down. Bad signs uh, from the French and from the Iroquois. Now, as far as the French were concerned, they had sent out these young men now for 13 years or so to learn native language, facilitate trades, keep the network going in their direction. One guy we've met several times before, quite a character, Antony Bruel. Champlain records that he got a report from the natives in this very year that Antony Bruel had become an unruly figure out in the wilderness among the natives, and in fact that he had become addicted to women. That's his words. We see in the summer of this same year that the Mohawk starts sniffing around the St. Lawrence. For the first time in a while, the Mohawk actually got as close to home as the outskirts of Quebec, where they were chased off by gun-toting clergy. And then the next year in 1622, the Mohawk return. This time in far larger numbers. They swarm around Quebec. And luckily for everybody, they decide not to attack. But they found a Recollet convent on the St. Charles. Not very well protected. It's at this location they decide to attack. And they manage to capture two Huron. These Huron would be very similar to the Iroquois. Nearly identical language. Very similar culture, very similar, similar political uh, constructs, uh, religious ideas, and clan systems. And yet, right outside the convent, just to torment the holy men inside, the two Huron were burned alive. And just like that, the Iroquois disappeared into the woods. We will hear many such stories in the decades to come. In light of these threats, Champlain sought to keep building on the relationship he had with these native allies, the Huron and the Innu in particular. He participated in the reciprocal tradition of gift-giving between native groups and hosting feasts and attending feasts, all the while constantly trying to get these native groups to reach a peace with the Iroquois. Because the French themselves did not have issue with the Iroquois. However, Champlain, in building this trade network, or at least just tapping into the trade network that the natives have already built, uh, came to have the same enemies that they had, which were chiefly the Haudenosaunee, otherwise known as the Iroquois Confederacy. And so in his heart of hearts, he didn't want to war with the Iroquois. He saw it as sort of a wasted effort. The only thing it did was ingratiate himself to his native allies, but at the end of the day, it was a cost of lives and effort and time that if it could be prevented and, you know, if a peace could be made between all of these groups, that would be lovely. Of course, old rivalries run quite deep. And even Champlain knew that there would be no easy fix to this problem. Fortunately, in this case, it appears that the Iroquois sent diplomats first to Quebec in order to negotiate a peace with the Innu. And then, of course, uh, Champlain sent Innu diplomats back into the Haudenosaunee lands to confirm that peace. And in the year 1623, they made a firm peace that would last at least till the end of the decade. So on the home front, he again just kept building up Quebec the best he could. If the native relations would fall through, at least there would be a foundation of French culture and civilization that he could fall back on. So better structures, more fortifications, more fields being cleared uh, to have your own supply of food to be self-sufficient. 
This period in time is also when we see the first seigneurial grants in Quebec. That's when land would be allowed it out to landowners who would operate it much like a manor in the English style. We're going to get into that quite a bit at a later time, but just, just know that the land is starting to be pieced out to individuals. It's at this time that he starts constructing actual roads. Up until this point, the St. Lawrence, the riverway, was the road. These years would be filled with the slow growing of a colony. The dull things that you probably don't find that interesting, and I honestly don't find that interesting. I like the blood and the gore and the guts and the gossip, but are nonetheless very important. In the fall of 1624, Champlain returns to France. He brings his wife Helene. He brings back the French servants. He learns that Montmorency had sold his viceroyalty to Duke de Ventanoa. That's the best I could say it. And as far as people in France are concerned, all of Champlain's old allies, the, the old supporters, connections to the king, they've all slowly gone away. He, he's now becoming a, a singular figure on the political end of this at the king's court. But as much as that's a disadvantage, the advantage on the merchant end, the capitalistic end, the money end, is that he knows this trade better than anyone else. So anyone who has control of trade in the St. Lawrence, they're going to want to employ Champlain. He's got all the connections. He's the distributor of the goods to all his native allies, and he is the receiver of the beaver pelts. Again, he had built uh, the New France operation back up to a profitable, lucrative state. However, Helene, back in Paris, uh, tells Champlain that she wants to stay. Furthermore, she wants to become a nun and move into a convent. It's hard to get any sort of sense of softness from the character that Champlain paints of himself in his works. It was a rough time, and he, he had to put himself up as a rough individual, capable, but could be very shrewd at times. But here, it seems like he was heartbroken that his, his young wife didn't want to be his wife. Divorce not being a very acceptable option. Becoming a nun was the only real avenue for a woman of her class and stature. But Champlain just couldn't let her go. He, he obviously had some affection for her. Whereas some writers have described the beginning of their marriage as a political arrangement, Helene being a pawn in a larger game, at this point, Champlain seems to genuinely love his wife and would seemingly grovel to any terms to keep her in his life. The historian Samuel Elliott Morrison said that eventually Champlain was able to convince Helene to stay married to him and to return to Quebec as long as Helene could be assured, in Morrison's words, that the two of them would sleep separately and live as brother and sister. I don't know if you've ever wanted someone or something when it was unattainable or when that person did not want you. And the longer you know that person or the longer you want that thing, the more it cuts really deep into you to parts that you didn't even know you had. I think this might be the first point in Champlain's life where he had that soft, gooey underbelly pierced for the first time but again men of his age they just kept that right in there just buried it deep down inside and just lived with it anyway back to the uh politics and the business so the new viceroy ventador was a devout catholic and he didn't like that the monopoly was being licensed out to this huguenot company the decayan company and so he couldn't exactly rescind the monopoly but he said all right, you can keep the monopoly, you Huguenot bastards, if you only use Catholics on your ships. So you own the operation, but the nuts and bolts, the crew on the ground in the New World, they have to be Catholic. Now this is the beginning of a growing trend you will see in the history of New France, where French authorities will purify the immigrant population to the New World and ensure that the people in their domain and the people spreading their religion among the natives would be Catholic. And so the many great Huguenots that we have mentioned, all the way from Florida up to present-day Canada, their stories are ending. Their legacies are being shrouded over. And instead of the New World being a place for religious outcasts, as uh, we would see in the English model, in the French model, the New World would become an opportunity 
to restart the best parts of French civilization in its purest and most refined form. And so we'll see this cut across all institutions. The most devout Catholics, the most rigid leadership, the Catholic Church ingrained into the colonial government uh, in the best fashion that the cardinals back home could possibly think of. And here in 1625, we see the introduction of the mighty Jesuits to New France. Officially, the Recollets uh, invited them to New France. However, it's pretty clear the Jesuits had shoved their way in. This powerful order had previously been associated with uh, the Iberian powers. And so they were often suspect in France for having foreign allegiances. But they would prove to have more resolve and more rigor than the Recollets would ever have. If you remember in the last episode, we talked about the, the poor old fathers who had to follow around the Innu and their strenuous lifestyle and how they barely lasted a winter before uh, finding a ship and heading back home. The Jesuits, however, would pride themselves on the tortures and torments that they were willing to undergo to spread the word of God. Back to Champlain. In 1626, he was still in France. However, reports from Quebec uh, were not good. Native relations, uh, even among the Allies, were not going well. And Quebec itself was falling apart. People were disappearing. The population of uh, the French there were actually dwindling. And so the Viceroy, Duke Ventador, orders Champlain to return. And he arrives in Quebec in the middle of the summer, only to find again that the Innu were intent on wiping the French completely off uh, the face of North America because there was an incident. Two Frenchmen were killed by some Innu. And again, this would be normally a recipe for a blood feud. The Innu would expect a reprisal from the French. Champlain, however, had a steady temper, and he simply wanted the actual perpetrators of the crime to be handed over. The natives, of course, refused to do this. Now, as we saw in French Florida, or in our many escapades during the last season of this podcast, this is usually the point where war breaks out. But Champlain kept a cool head, and instead he arranged for the natives to bring some of their young to the French to live among them. Half adoptee, half captives, they would live an open life, but they would be in close proximity to the French in case anything did break out, you would suddenly have hostages to negotiate for. You'll see similar practices uh, like this all over North America. Uh, you'll see it in parts of Africa and even in medieval Europe. Sometimes a, a prince or a duke's son will be given over to a rival power for a certain amount of time. The Jesuits, who came over with him, uh, very quickly started to spread all over the inside of the continent to places that are now in western New York, among the neutral nation, among the Huron. And immediately, they wanted a lot of these couriers de bois to be returned to French authorities. These young men who were sent out to be interpreters and to facil facilitate trade, uh, the Jesuits found that they were the worst parts of French society, French culture. Whereas the Jesuits saw the natives as being basically empty. In some sense, they believed that the natives succumbed to the wills of devils, and they worship demons, but at the same time, the natives lacked any sort of culture or refinement or sophisticated technology. Therefore, they were blank to be filled up, to be educated. They were perfect pupils, but if they were tainted by the snake that were these young men with their unquenchable urges, the entire affair uh, would fall apart. And so the Jesuits almost immediately started asking French authorities to recall these Corios de Bois. And, of course, Antony Bruel was suspect number one. The Jesuits hated this guy because apparently he was just playboying his way all over the middle of the continent. The Jesuits were also part of an effort to finally remove the decaying family. And now that there was some opportunity in New France, a fairly stable fur trade that Champlain had set up, let the real money move in. And so in the magical year 1627, Everything gets pulled. Not only is the decaying family gone, but Ventador loses his viceroyalty. Everything uh, devolves back to the crown. And who's in charge of France at the time? Who's really in charge of France at the time? Cardinal Richelieu. Now our man Champlain is safe, but above him, there would be a new grand company uniting the business interests and the political interests and the religious interests 
into this company of 100 associates. That would be the English translation of it anyway. Finally, there was the national vision and the financial backing in place to turn New France into a grand European-style economy and not just a series of trading posts. Mind you, at this time, we already have Jamestown taking off. We have Plymouth. We have uh, the Massachusetts Bay Company coming in a year or two. Plans already underway. And then the Dutch, of course, now have a hold on the Hudson. The French knew this was the time to up the ante. It was now or never. Champlain actually became one of the 100 associates. Again, massively wealthy himself. And Richelieu's new domain for New France that the 100 associates would uh, rule over actually spanned the North Pole all the way down to Florida, at least on paper. Again, remember, uh, Florida used to be contested between France and Spain. And then, of course, Spain won out. Now, here we are, a generation and a half, two generations later, and Richelieu is saying, nah, all of it. It's all ours. Of course, a paper claim is just that. But Francis Parkman writes that a trading company was now feudal proprietor of all the domains in North America with the claim of France. To begin to even capitalize on these claims, uh, the massive initial investment was spent on recruiting tons and tons of colonists, tons of supplies. If Richelieu was to have his way, New France, Richelieu's plan was to increase the actual French population of New France eight, nine, or tenfold by the end of the decade. Part of what inspired this renewed interest in New France and what will complicate these plans were the uh, tensions between the English and the French. And around 1627 to about 1629, there was a war, the Anglo-French War of 1627 to 1629. They weren't very creative with naming wars back then. And there were two different parties on the English-speaking side of affairs that were looking to pick off the weak possessions of the French. First, you had the Kirk brothers, who had an English father and a French mother, spent a lot of time in France, and uh, now had trading operations out of London, receiving imports from the French. Of course, with the outbreak of a war, that wouldn't quite be possible anymore, so they looked for other opportunities. And the man who stood in the way of these opportunities in the New World were Sir William Alexander, who had some pre-existing claims to territories in and around the North Atlantic. But these Anglos were smart. Instead of competing with one another, in 1627 they formed the Scottish and English Company, with the express interest of picking away what we've seen in Acadia, and then Champlain's own operations centered around Quebec. Of course, Samuel wasn't aware of any of this, as the late 1620s proved to be a difficult time for him. Lots of drama going on on the ground. That peace made with the Iroquois was in jeopardy, as his native allies caught two Iroquois in the St. Lawrence. Now, this could have been a source for a new uh, blood feud between the different native groups. Champlain was able to convince them to hand over one Iroquois to him. And that individual was showered with gifts, treated very nicely, uh, was the, the center of feasts, and then sent back to the Iroquois with all the words of peace. A wise move on Champlain's part. However, the natives, with the other captive, well, they took him, and they tortured him slowly, as they do. They cut off his limbs one by one. They burned him, and then once he was dead, they ate him. Luckily, that doesn't seem to have spurred on any sort of uh, war between the Haudenosaunee and Champlain's native allies. Uh, lucky for Champlain, uh, as he heard murmurings of, the Mohawk, the easternmost member of the Iroquois Confederacy, was involved in a war with the Mohegan people in order to gain access to Fort Orange, where the Dutch could supply them with European goods. And so the Iroquois had their own aims in mind, and they were far to the south of where Champlain was. And then as a repeat from a year or two before, two cattlemen, French cattlemen, were stabbed and then had their heads bashed in and then were, then were thrown in a river by a group of Innu. Champlain, showing again that he's a very moderate person, perhaps too moderate in this case, uh, agreed to again take in some of the Innu as captives in quotes, although they suffered no ill treatment. And in fact, Champlain had managed to turn around these interactions so quickly that by January of 1628, just a few months later, the Innu were leaving more and more of their population with Champlain at Quebec because they had run out of food. And just as Champlain had done the same many years ago when he ran out of food, you take each other in because you're allies. Three of these girls the Innu gave to Champlain uh, to become adopted daughters. They were 11, 12, and 15 years old. 
these native young women suddenly breathed a little fresh air into the household of the Champlains. Helene was now a mother, Champlain a father. And despite their earlier agreement to live as brother and sister, maybe this created some sense of normalcy. This is certainly the closest that Champlain ever got to having what we would consider a nuclear family. These young women converted to Catholicism and learned French and became quite close. It was a genuine parental relationship. And so by the spring of 1628, Champlain's life is going great. And the entire operation is running smoothly. Back home, they're seeing 40% returns on their investments annually. More land is being cleared in Quebec in an effort to become self-sufficient, which they still weren't. Oxen were imported for the first time. The Hebert family, receiving the first seniorial grant, received these oxen and were able to use a plow, clearing out more land than Quebec had ever had under cultivation. But again, going back to those Kirk brothers, lurking around, sniffing out opportunities. The year 1628 was their time to pounce. Their father, Gervais Kirk, had uh, perhaps been a traitor in the St. Lawrence before Champlain forced out all the people who didn't participate in his monopoly. Heavily connected both with French merchants and English merchants, in the midst of this war between these two great powers, he received an English patent for basically all of New France. And in this year, he puts together three huge armored ships and puts in charge of each ship one of his sons, David, Lewis and Thomas. Lurking around the St. Lawrence, they were able to capture or receive defectors from Champlain's party, including Antony Bruel, the always troublesome Corio de Bois. And because these trading posts were so spread out, Champlain's operations so elongated to reach deep into the continent, the Kirk brothers were able to mop everybody up one at a time. And the more people they took, and the more ships they took, the more powerful they became. And with their French connections, they received word that Richelieu was sending a huge fleet of supplies and men to inundate Quebec with new life. This was all done with the initial funding from the uh, Company of 100 Associates. Unfortunately for Champlain, the Kirk brothers were able to intercept everyone they sent over. We're talking tons of supplies and hundreds of colonists. And of course, all of their boats, arms, and ammunition. One small boat from Richelieu's fleet actually made it to Quebec. It had 11 men on board and basically no supplies. Once again, Quebec is not self-sufficient. They were depending on those imports. And in Champlain's own words, translated of course, he says that these 11 men meant just so many more additional mouths to feed. And of course, they came with the ominous news that the St. Lawrence was being taken apart piece by piece. The Kirk brothers, then slightly outside of the view of Quebec, took a captured Basque fisherman, stuck him in a boat with a letter, sent him to the city of Quebec, asking Champlain politely to surrender the settlement. Champlain, of course, politely sent a letter back saying, no, I'd rather not. Adding to the end, of course, that honor demands we fight to the death. Now Champlain, although getting up in years, he was a battle-hardened soldier. Go back 30 or so years, he's fighting wars in Europe. Then he was employed as a spy. And then he'd, he'd become the boogeyman of the Iroquois, chasing them out of the St. Lawrence multiple times, and participating in the attack on Onondaga, the very center of the Haudenosaunee world. Champlain wasn't going to be pushed over, seeing as how he was at a stalemate with Champlain. Kirk burned all of Champlain's ships that he could, destroyed Tadoussac, destroyed any farms he could get to, ruining the few meager crops they would have uh, come harvest season, and decided that he could wait for Champlain to surrender. Perhaps a smart move, because how long could Champlain hold out? The natives were already starving. We, we'd seen the year before they ran out of food. They didn't have any surplus uh, to give to him. The fields spoiled, the supplies for the year taken, and Kirk managed to take pretty much all of New France without ever having to step foot in Quebec. Back in France, many French communities considered the Kirk brothers to be French themselves, as their mother was. They were being burned in effigy as traitors, because it was known what they did. And Richelieu tried to raise some more funds to supply poor Champlain and the remains of what was New France. But seeing how quickly the Kirk brothers had swept up the entire initial funding of the colony, and many hundreds of people, the wealthy of course, who were being held for ransom, he couldn't find anybody else who'd be willing to dump more money into this venture. So Champlain and his people were alone. 
The fall and winter of 1628 into 1629, Champlain had to ration out all the remaining food. Everyone was down to seven ounces a day of dried beef and peas, and then he was able to supplement that with eels he pulled from the river in a fashion that he learned from the Innu many years before, when Quebec was first founded. And as those few supplies began to dry up, colonists were uh, to be seen roaming the forest, eating acorns and roots that they pulled from the frozen ground. Champlain sent out one small expedition to rob a Mohawk outpost and gather any supplies that might be there. His native allies saw uh, the plight that the Frenchmen were going through and provided a few moose occasionally to supplement their diets. And eventually, just as the Innu had done several years before, he had asked his native friends to take in his population. He sent a group of 20 to go live among the Huron for the winter and then slowly began scattering more and more of his men to various tribes. So as, rather than surrender to the Kirk brothers, he would simply disperse his population. The winter was bleak and cold, everyone was hungry, and the, the, the one remaining spot of New France was slowly dissolving. But Champlain had his family, he had love in his life. People were actually enthusiastic about clearing land because they were starving and wanted to grow food with the few seeds they had. The old Pont Grave, who was a bit of a tutor to Champlain, who we uh, mentioned far more often in the past, but is still hanging around. He's at Quebec, and he's probably in his 70s at this point, or close to it, suffering from gout. And because of the starvation, he actually recovered from that affliction. So I guess the optimist could see a few bright points in this story. But even after the winter was falling away and spring was coming, the French resupply ships weren't coming in. The Kirks still had command of the riverway. The only thing in the situation that had changed is Champlain had less prospects, less men, less supplies, less resolve uh, than he had in the fall of the previous year. What Champlain didn't know yet is that the Kirks and their associates had mopped up every part of New France, not just his operation along the St. Lawrence, but Acadia and various fishing outfits among the islands. Charles I of England gave all sorts of titles to these men gave them all sorts of monopolies, and ordered that all the French settlements be destroyed. At this point, Champlain's Quebec being the only holdout. And now the Kirks in New France probably outnumbered the French 10 to 1. And so without resupply in the spring, summer came on. Champlain, even more hungry, even more desperate. Ships, of course, are spotted on the horizon. And they are, again, English ships. This time commanded by Lewis and Thomas Kirk. They again ask for Champlain to surrender Quebec, and this time he does. In doing so, New France was no more. What Champlain spent the better part of 30 years building, the Kirk brothers took in about one year. And as Champlain went from being a leader to a captive, he was about to lose so much more. But we'll talk about that on our next episode. I'm Eric Giannis. This has been the Other States of America History Podcast. Thank you for listening.